Adventure, the Aqua Brain. I'm your Virgil, Drew. On today's show, we're going to talk snow skate history. We're going to talk snow skate events. We're going to talk snow skate magazine. That's right, Starfish Magazine. Ladies and gentlemen, I met up up at Snoqualmie Pass many years ago. Tim Levitt. There he is. All right. Hey, Tim, how's it going? Good. How are you? What's he being taken over by the fungus? Oh, uh, yeah. That happened a long time ago. How did snow skating start? Funny you should ask. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the first record that we could find of it when we did this article was in uh, 1978. This appeared in a magazine. This was actually the word snow skate coming through. And this company from Santa Cruz had developed this kind of biodex snow skate that attached onto a skateboard. Um, and that was in 1978. Uh, the place was called uh, Pan Western Enterprises, and they became the first people to actually trademark the words snow skate. So that kind of made them that. 78. 78. So way before a lot of people were claiming to invent it. And then, uh, you know, a few years later, they came out with this one came out in Europe. <laughs> okay. Wow. Which is ob obviously a bi-deck snow Ooh, skate or sword. Right. This was called wow. the this is called the swing bow. This thing is just a swing incredibly over-engineered and expensive i i i got How that someone it, gave me that but it retailed for a ridiculous amount of money back in like the how did 1980s you, how do you ride something like that oh it's terrible if you look at this, <laughs> like this diagram here of the trucks and this whole super complicated system that they had going on there's ski brakes on there and stuff no need no to, need for obviously either. you're not supposed to use a leash and the snowster came in 1991 from Newport, California, which is another similar, very similar bi-deck snow skate design. And that was before Andy. Andy Wolf started in 1993, where he invented the snow skate. And then, then in the 90s, Steve Frink invented the snow skate at Stevens Pass, where he, they say he invented the first bi-deck snow skate, but obviously that's not true. Uh, yeah. But he just put a ski onto the bottom of the, of the board. And then in 98, I got Elkins came along and started making the fuse snow skates, uh, which okay. was basically a skateboard with four little skis on the bottom. Yeah. How did that thing ride? Like that. How did uh, that ride? I never had a lot of real good luck on it, but there was a lot of dudes who were um, real good. Okay. And then around 2000, I think Frank, let me say here. Yeah, Frank introduced Olsen to it. Once Olsen saw it, then he started trying to recreate it and make it better right away. And he started coming out with his own designs. The Burton Junkyards were hitting the market around this time, too. They must have knocked off Steve Frank around the same time. They kind of made these, you know, true to their fashion. They weren't really trying to push it and make it anything better than what it was. It was just kind of a gimmick they were trying to capitalize on. Lib started to launch this kind of experimental program where they started making all sorts of boards and stuff like that. And that's they actually, awesome. that's kind of what led, that's kind of what led to... Um, the magnet traction thing and the banana thing as well, because the magnet traction, they were experimenting on how to get these shorter skis to um, cut better. And Steve Cobb was like, you know, put it on, put this magnet traction on there. And then it was like, oh, this actually, you know, it works pretty good. So how did your home resort react to snow skating? Our ski resort was super open with it right away. We never That's had good. any problems. That's awesome. Crush was, Crush was definitely instrumental in that because he was down with the lib dudes and he had, got a snow skate he was like started putting them in their catalogs and stuff like that and we actually did an interview with uh, bob stein and starfish who as a he was our um he was the head of all lift operations at the ski area we did an interview with him trying to convince other ski resorts that would give us a hassle that they should allow it as well uh you know so awesome. Palmy's always been real open to that kind of stuff it was the first place where they allowed uh snowboarding really a lot of people don't know that but you know, Olson, the same guy we were talking about earlier, he actually invented yeah. the snow. People say Jake Burton invented Whoa. the snowboard, but there was several dudes that invented, just like the snow skate. There was several dudes yeah. who had invented yeah. the snowboard by the time Jake had invented it, and they were all doing their same thing. You know, Olson was out here doing his thing, and he had made boards and snowboards with bindings, right. and yeah. he had been riding them up at the ski resort here at, you know, the summit at Snoqualmie, yeah. back when he was owned by this Believe family it. called the Moffats, and the Moffats were real cool with that. So he was allowed to ride the chairlifts. 
legally, ride the chairlifts at yeah, the ski resort. Cool. And then the wow. Burton board started coming out and they started flooding the market with more what? boards and bad bindings, which I'm, I would doubt his bindings were that much better, but they were just all of a sudden much more available and the bindings started failing and stuff. And Moffitt said to Mike, he said, uh, no more. <laughs> and that what? shut down every, and then that shut it down. And then two years later, Mount Baker opened up to snowboarding. Unbelievable. How did you first get introduced to snow skating? I saw Micah Shapiro came down the hill with one and he showed it to me. I was like, no way. He's like, you do. You got to take, he knew I was a skateboarder yeah, yeah. and a snowboarder, you know, he was working for Mervin at the time. And he's like, dude, you need one of these. Cause he knew that I lived at the ski resort and I was basically a full-time ski bump. So he gave it to me and I was like, sick, I got one. We were breaking a lot of boards because they had those yeah. the bent metal trucks on there, which had that fixed point which created a fulcrum basically, which cracks allowed the, the, ski. the back to crack of the ski to crack off. <laughs> yeah. So Jake came up with this alternative to have this rocker ski, you know, and then everybody, people started complaining to live and stuff. And they'd be like, Oh, you know, all our boards should come with rockers. All our come boards should come with rockers. And the lib was real cool about it. They were just like, well, why would we, you know, we want people to buy them from Jake. We don't need to like step on Jake's shoes. When it rank was quote, he was like a uh, snowboarding is a reason to suck at skating you know, this is what I wanted. This is like, I probably would have never started snowboarding had I had one of these when I was a kid. Cause when we were younger, we'd just take our boards off and, you know, ride down the hill. So that was around, you know, 2000, we started getting into snow skating and we had fun, you know, and it felt like because the boards had evolved to be um, so sick and we had a bunch of dudes who were like super good skaters that we were like, you know, we should make a magazine. And this is when, uh, you know, Big yeah. Brother magazine was fresh in everybody's mind because Big Brother yeah. had just been out of business and everybody was like, this seems like fun. They had a lot of fun when they were doing this. So we should have I'm, a lot of fun and we should do the same. We should do something similar. So it took us a few years to actually get together and um, put out what would end up being the first magazine, which I made in a Microsoft publisher and we printed out at Kinko's. <laughs> <laughs> and uh we went and shot it all in one day jimmy clark came and he was like an awesome pretty well-known photographer at the time um for snowboarding he was the kind of guy who i could sit and take a picture and jimmy would sit and take a picture from the exact same spot at the exact same time and his would come out much better than mine um which was awesome so he went out and just like shot the first first issue and you know we, there's all these um stuff in here saying, you know, we're in Austria, we're all over the place and different people involved because we were trying to create the illusion that we were, you know, there was a bunch of us involved and there was this big thing going on. So I took these like 10 copies of this magazine and I took them into uh, Lib and they were, Pete, sorry, I might've been the first time I really met him. He was like, we're down. And he gave me some money, like a hundred bucks, you know? And then yeah. happenstance, I ran into this people who owned the um, Cascade Times newspaper Okay. And I was talking to him about what I was doing. He's like, you, he's like, you got to use my printer. I was like, who's your printer? He said, oh, Pacific Publishing in West Seattle. So I went down there and this guy was like, oh yeah, I'll get you 1,200 copies for 400 bucks, black and white. And I was like, all right, man. So we went from like yeah. wow. 10 copies to like 1,200 copies. And then we got a hold of the, uh, you know, Ryan Davis was sales rep, I think. He probably, I don't know what his job title is right now. He definitely still works for him. He gave me the, uh, their shop list. And then Clark was working oh. for Trilogy Arts and he had the, all the shop lists too. And then Mervin just started putting stacks of magazine in every box that they shipped out. Every box of snowboards got a stack That's of starfish. Awesome. So then they just boom all across the country. And then we said we went wow. to Canada. And then That's we awesome. went to Canada and then we started claiming starfish international. You want to read us the letter to the editor from that issue? So as I'm smoking weed out of the beer can, I say, everyone was hyped. Everyone said, put this in the zine, put that in the zine. Now it's fall and I'm sitting here with an almost empty glass, no articles. The snow skate zine must go on. Bindings are for the bedroom. This is supposed to be a snow skate zine. Most of the pictures will be of snow skates and skateboards. Of course, with Jimmy and John involved, we'll have some gratuitous art shots. Articles? We'll have to see. Put this in the zine. Put that in the zine. Put what in the zine? Where's it at? I'm supposed to be an editor and I have nothing. I doubt it will write another article, another intro before the snow falls and the zine comes out. All of us at Starfish are sick of the Olympic hopeful, X Games, road trip contest, snow jock, bro, blah, 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 bullshit articles coming out lately. Who really reads, who really reads that shit? Who reads a 1,000 page Transworld snowboarding? Jock City, do your push-ups. Was that a nine or a 9.2? 
I don't know what you'll read in this zine because I have not actually written anything yet, but I know it won't be that bullshit. But now my glass is empty and this intro is lame, so we'll end it. So who all was involved in that first issue? It was me and Clark, Jimmy Clark, Clark Hurlbutt too, number three in the world, Big John Carlson, Jake, Bennett Goldberg, Mahala's in there, Bowen, Peter Kay, Danny Sullivan. Yeah, they, I mean, that was, that was pretty much our crew. Clark Hurlbutt, number three in the world. So tell me the story behind that. So a few years before this magazine came out, because it took us a few years to make, uh, me, they had already had, Andy Wolf had already had the uh, World Cups, snow skating World Cups down at Mount Hood, which I don't think I went to, but uh, Clark went down there and he got third place. And we, um, whatever. So then we went to Mission Ridge and we went to Mission Ridge and they had demo days was going on and the Vans tent was there and Vans had a bunch of shoes and I knew the guys at Vans from snowboarding and I was like, hey, can I have some shoes? You know, I'm doing starfish. And they were like, yeah, man, have a couple pairs of shoes. And then Clark was like, Clark was standing there. He's like, well, I want some shoes. And then Joey McGuire was standing there and Joey was like, he's number three in the world. And then Clark was like, yeah, I'm number three in the world. And then the name just stuck. And then, so then he got his, he got his Vans and then he was even on the cover of the first one. It says here, Clark, number three in the world. But at every contest, Clark just kept getting third. It was always like Alan and Jake and they couldn't, he could never edge him out. No matter, it was always Jake and someone else and he always got third. It was kind of, it was Dharma, I guess. Yeah, I always wondered that. So tell me about the name Starfish. Where did that come from? The same day that Clark got named number three in the world, we were at uh, Mission Ridge, obviously. Um, and we were, they had big icy groomers. And this is we were kind of just first started snow skating. We didn't really know what we were doing. We had the little boards. And, you know, we, everything was kind of new to us. So we were like bombing at what seemed to be at outrageous speeds, you know, probably like 40 miles an hour down these steep, icy, icy slopes at Mission Ridge. And we hit this, we bombed this one hill. And I got back to the lift and Clark wasn't there. And he came rolling up about a few minutes later. And I say, you know, what happened? And he said, I fell at that fastest, steepest part. I was like, what'd you do? Because we didn't even know what you would do. He's like, I, star I starfished out of it. And, I, and we were like, cool. I knew exactly what he meant. So yeah, then we started the magazine. Everybody started their companies. You know, Lib was already in there. And then the rocker truck started getting in there. And then Pluto Sports immediately was one of the first com companies that contacted us and was like, we want to advertise with you. He sent me this email that said, um, y'all seem be idiots, but you're the only <laughs> other people that snow skate. So I'll hang out with you and read your shit. You know, he ended up, he stayed with us to, through the entire thing. Uh, he was always back in this. He actually, they actually flew me and Clark down there. Um, it was probably like the highlight of the whole starfish thing was when we, me and Clark flew down to Tennessee, of all places, in North Carolina. And we just went and cruised around and hit snow skate parks and drank moonshine and skated. And um, we were down there for quite a while. And Tomoki was with us, too, on that trip. He was like, he was a photographer, snow skater guy, you know. So Tomoki was in right away too through Pluto. Oh, cool. And then ro rocker trucks showed up, you know, immediately afterwards, kind of out of necessity, basically. Uh, right. Jake, right. Jake was already owned right. a machining right. shop. He owned CNC machines. He owned everything he needed to do it. He was already making stuff with metal. So it was easy for him to just start doing experiments and start trying to make something that was actually better. Game changer around like midway in this thing, I broke my back and um, oh, which I broke my back. So this was like the second time I broke my back, which is kind uh, of when Starfish had this big jump forward in technology because while my back was broken, I, I spent most of my time learning how to use InDesign, which is the design software where it's kind of the, more of the industry standard Yeah. in publishing, which my printer at the time was at Pacific Publishing was like, you got to start using InDesign. You got to start using InDesign. So then this was right when the InDesign was coming out with their first creative cloud uh, experience. Oh, so gotcha. I sat there with my back brace on and learned to do that. And Starfish came back, you know, glossy and going full color and um, with a lot better, more text support. And I just started taking more pictures. Dane showed up on the scene and he lived at my house and he was down to just shoot photos and hang out. I was shooting under a photographer name. I was writing stories under a different name. I was you know, <laughs> putting different stuff, even trying to make it look like we had a yeah. lot of people you want to be involved with a magazine they think it's all about them 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 and their photos and stuff but without the photographers and the people behind them you know to get the stuff to the computer stream where it can get laid out and out of just yeah. people's imagination and actually onto something that's printable so much work 
you know, it takes, it takes people, you know, like Dane who weren't doing it for, you know, um, themselves self-promotion or anything like that you know and then the powder guys started to come and then the no borders and then you know the florida powder skates the, the owner of florida powder skates is one of my best friends since i was like 15 and i actually came up with the florida powder skate he moved down to florida for like a year or something i i hated that he moved down there and he started making snow skates while he was down there so i was yeah. like oh you call him the florida powder skate huh, huh, huh. and then the name ah. That's the story he, right there. Yeah. And since he was like my good friend, he obviously he starts showing up in the mag. He's sending me boards. The board starts getting in Dane's hands. We start getting pictures around that middle time. This, the whole design of snow skates just changed. Everybody was doing experimental stuff. Everybody was making big boards. Uh, people were making powder surfers. Wole, Nivet, he was doing his thing. He was in the magazine. Those guys were sending me pictures. And then Jeremy Jensen, he was like his own media right yeah paparazzi, paparazzi yeah. all by himself i mean he yeah. made them. he was like the, the dream guy for me because it was like sick you know this guy will do Same stuff moment. yeah towards the end of it you know I, I was doing less and less and letting people be more involved and kind of just being the editor and the person who was compiling it together yeah. So at the beginning of the year, I'd, I'd contact every single company. I'd tell them all the same thing. Hey, we're doing the buyer's guide. Do you want to be in it? Which means buy an ad. And then you want to, you want to be in it. How much you guys want to write a story, which is a chance to plug your ad. You know, the yeah. story accentuates the ad. It goes along with it. Um, and Jeremy Jensen would be like, yeah, I'll do it. I'll write a six page article. I'll send you 200 photos and I'll send you a video and a QR code for the cover and <laughs> graphics and all that stuff. And I was like, yeah, you got it, man. And then other people would be like, whoa, what is it all about grassroots? Why is it all about grassroots? It's like, well, you had every, you had every opportunity he did. I gave you the exact same chance he had. And he's the only one who cared enough to do it. What was Jordan Armstrong's role, Tim? <laughs> oh, Jordan was awesome. We met him when he was like a little kid. I remember the first time I met him, he was like probably 18. He had driven down from Canada. And I think it was the year it didn't snow maybe. And we were like driving our trucks up the hill and riding this half pipe. And Jordan was sitting in the bottom in his van. And he had this like premier deck premier snow skate and i was i looked at his snow skate and i was like looks like you got hosed by andy wolf and he looks at me he goes actually i ride for him and i was like oh so you get really? hosed. and i was like oh so you get hosed all the time and he just laughed and then he started like making his own stuff wow and then and he then he's like flat then he too. Was our, yeah he's good at all that stuff you know he just anything he's like Alan. those guys can just ride everything and yeah. anyways he was kind of our web dude who ended up like trying to build the web pages for us and like he was kind of very instrumental in our online presence and like getting us onto uh facebook right you know yeah. when we when we got starfish got on facebook it stirred up a ton of shit because for me i didn't understand how facebook had really worked at all yeah so um i i kind of thought this was an outlet for me to like publish stuff i wouldn't be able to publish in the magazine you know like the stuff that tim does want to publish you know so i went on there and i you know i suggested to the no i suggested to the no boarders that you know something might i was like you know everybody's ridden a snowboard without bindings on it it doesn't really work that good bottom line if you tried a bunch of other stuff there is stuff that works better you know whether yep. it be jim jensen stuff or the florida powder skates or this and that and that and those guys got fucking pissed man <laughs> oh, no. you know we were like changing our shit all the time changing trucks changing oh, setups yeah. grips changing grips changing shoes trying to find a leash yeah. that didn't bang you in the head how things went was we did it every year we did the uh, buyer's guide and then the interview issue and then uh we end up doing the April Fool's issue every year, which people really got worked out about those. They were awesome. Quincy did the Narboots, the Man Child takeover. Flor Narb took over the magazine and did all the editor and stuff. Oh, yeah. Like that. So fun, man. And when, another way I was kind of like alienating myself a little bit was because uh, I always kind of was into cartoons and cartooning and stuff like that. I kind of wanted the magazine to be like a um, bunch of cartoons and stuff like that you know and people get worked up about that they're like oh levitt you said this i was like no i didn't say that that's this little talking cartoon Look, you said that yeah you got a bad attitude look at him man yeah. it's not me i'm writing it for him tell me about the serpentine massacre how'd you get the name and where did it start and how did it start we were a couple of years into um the magazine and we just thought it would be a fun thing to do we were like, oh, we're going to do a Chinese downhill from the top of Serpentine, which everybody who ever rides Serpentine is like, it would be sick to race down this. So we were like, yeah, let's all race down there, which fortunately there was the avalanche that first year because everybody showed up. So we ended up moving it over to Outback. 
oh yeah, so we needed the name. So we call it Serpentine after the run, Serpentine. And then the massacre part came from the 80s um, skateboard movie, Thrashing. Josh Brolin in it and the Red Hot Chili Peppers. At the end of it, the kind of the climax of this whole thing is this big downhill skateboard race called the LA Massacre. So it's like, oh, well, that's what a downhill, downhill race is supposed to be called, a massacre, a little serpentine massacre. Yeah, so we just advertised the magazine. Boy, like 30, 35 people showed up, you know, and then we all did it at Silver Fur and we just one run. That was it. That's really cool. And then we just parted in the parking lot and, it, you know, Beck may, had made this sick, super sick trophy of this glass dragon with a skull head and it's like pulling his head off and it's it's super sick if anybody's seen it so then we we're like oh let's make it like the stanley cup and you just write your name on and we'll bring it back every year i made like a little wooden pedestal for it yeah and then um yeah we wrote our name on it every year so then um chris died oh shit yeah <laughs> right you right. know after heart attack after the trophy right. had been delivered yeah chris died he actually died on the hill uh yeah he had a heart attack it was kind of it was a trip for, you know, it was a trip for everybody. I was going to the top chair and I was like, I waved at him. I was like, hey, Chris, what are you doing, man? Let's go to the top chair. And he looked at me and pointed his heart out. And then he collapsed midway down his run and then they CPR'd him in the lodge uh, for a while, yeah. which was pretty gnarly because he had like a pregnant girlfriend and he was about yeah. to get married to her and all this blah, blah, blah. But it was, it was pretty gnarly. But oh, anyways, man. people really wanted the trophy after that because then it was irreplaceable. Um, oh, not that it yeah. was replaceable. Oh, yeah. Not that not that no, he was the, replaceable while he was alive, but yeah, there's people something. wanted the trophy and people didn't want didn't want the trophy to leave. The there's past. a connection. It doesn't there's leave the past very often. But it's yeah. in Canada right now, but uh it should be back around the past. This year you guys uh you guys were still able to to make it happen for a selection. This year, yeah, we still made it happen. You know, this was our eleventh year and um we just showed up and Things hadn't been totally locked down at that point in time, so we showed up and hiked up the hill, and we all raced at once, which was cool. I mean, there's only like 20 of us, and we started from the very top of the hill instead of like worrying about public because there was no public on the hill. Yeah. Uh, and then we raced all the way down to the parking lot, which was super fun too. That's awesome, yeah. Yeah, so if everybody shows up, there's usually about 50 people show up. We do um, five-man heats. So there's about 10 five-man heats. If you win your five-man heat, you go to the finals. If you get second or third, you have to race everybody else that got second or third. So that's, oh, that's the race you don't, that's the race you kind of want to avoid because that yeah. race is like 30 dudes. Yeah, and then of, of those 30 dudes, we take the top 10 and those top 10 go to the finals. So the finals ends up being like 20, but the, the semifinals got all like 30 dudes and everyone else who claims they should have been in there and they got cheated or whatever else, everyone who wants to bitch, they get in there too. And then you got to race them all. And it, it's super hectic. Um, so yeah, that's okay. how you get to the final. Right. Win your five man heat. If you don't win your five man heat, you go to the qual semifinals. If you win your semifinal, you go to the final. That's awesome. If you win the final, you get the trophy, you get the free pass, you get some lib tech ski, you know, some rocker trucks some nice. Boyd Hill booty. So yeah, we did that for, we did that for four or five years. I don't even know. And then, and then finally I was at the bar and I seen Dan Brewster, who was the general manager of the ski resort at the time. And he was one of our bigger backers. He was like, always, I was always, he was always real nice to me. I was like, Dan, I had 50 people at the Serpentine Massacre this year. I was like, did you have that many people at any of your events? He's like, no. I was like, so I'm your biggest event. He's like, yeah. I was like, well, why don't you guys start helping me out then and let's make this thing sick. So then they, he was like, absolutely. He's, I was like, can I get a pass for the winter? He's like, absolutely. He's like, can I get the course closed? He's like, absolutely. Nice. He's like, can we get a, can we get a band to get play in the, play in the lodge, which we're going to tell them we're going to pay and then we're not going to pay them? Absolutely. You know, no problem with that. Does the race have any rules? Oh yeah. When we, when we first started, when we first started, you know, I got to, I'm like the ringleader. So I got to stand up and like tell everybody there is some rules, you know? Yeah, that's my speech. I'm like, welcome to the Serpentine Massacre. First person to the bottom wins. If you hit anybody who's not on a snow skate, you're out of your race. If you hit anybody who's not on a snow skate, who's under three feet tall, you're out of the race. And you're never coming back. If you hit anybody who's out, not on a snow skate and is wearing a red coat, you're out for life. Wow. And Did that ever uh, happen? Yeah, oh, for we, never, we, hit a ski, we never hit a ski patroller, but a couple of okay. families got taken out. Brian Pikey took out a family, and John Knox took out a and family. And were they too. wearing red just to, just to rub salt? No, 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 but they, like, wiped out the, the parents and the kids and, like, the whole... Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. 
you guys are quarantined. But and then later, you know, I, I later I was like, you guys can come back, but they were like, no, we won't come back. No, Pikey man. comes every year, does the cooking and stuff, and he did race this year because we had a closed, you know, very That's special cool. Situation. Yeah, it was an invite only thing this year, which was yeah, it worked out pretty good. And who won uh, this year, and how does that work for the retroactive holding of the trophy? Is that uh, how did that well, how's that going to work? We're going to get the trophy back. He's going to probably hold on to it a while because that kid's super fast. Oh, you don't think he's going anywhere? And I, he's definitely nah, the, he the lives man in to beat. He's a past the- local. He works up there, and he's like super fast, man. I was doing. I thought I was doing pretty good in that race because Baker didn't know where the finish line was, so I passed him, and I was like. Then I straight lined the bottom part. So I was like, I was way in front of those dudes, like 100 yards in front of the 150 yards before I crashed. Oh. And I thought I was winning, but the reality was that Ryan was so far ahead of me that I couldn't even see him. He sounds like the man to beat. So tell me about the Chinese uphill. The Chinese uphill. We've been doing that, we've been doing that for probably close to 10 years. But in between the part, there's the upper parking lot and the lower parking lot at Hayek. And yeah. in between was like a 60 foot tall snowbank wall of just dog poop and <laughs> rock, rocks and dirt and just yeah. oh, super man. steep with like a little creek there. So we put a snow skate on top of that little hill and everybody goes at once and tries to climb up this snow bank and whoever gets to the top first gets the snow skate. So that one's wow. pretty sick. People are like pulling each other down and yeah, there's yeah. more blood on that than there is probably on the massacre. This one, people are hitting their elbows on rocks and stuff. Man, it's fun though for a spectator point of view. I've never actually done it, you know, but um, yeah, watched a lot of dudes do it, and usually the younger, lighter kids or more yeah, agile, they yeah. Be, like the ones on, on top end up with the skate. It is a heck of an event. I recommend everybody come checking out. So I want to switch gears back to the magazine, and I was wondering what what was it that led up to you just finally saying you know what we're not printing any more of these things you know the magazine started getting bigger and bigger you know i was shooting i was writing under fake names i was taking pictures under fake names and we were were shooting at fake locations and it was always kind of a try to promote snow skating and make it kind of look better like it was more than just like the six of us doing stuff and i think there was a lot of inside jokes and stuff like that and there people didn't really understand and you know the fact that we were making 2000 copies of this magazine that really only involved a few people and it was really only important to a few people and outsiders were kind of reading it and looking in and they they i don't know maybe they thought there was more there than there was which is definitely what we were trying to make them do because we wanted people to think snow skating was awesome you know? <laughs> right it was um self-sufficient basically from the first issue on i didn't really have to put a lot of money into it i didn't make money either but it was always always just flipping the same money over and over and over and just loaning out money Every time, it, you know, people wouldn't understand. They'd be like, can I give you a snow skate? I'm like, oh, my, my printer doesn't take snow skates, man. I'm not putting in more money for yeah this, for you to sit there and try and advertise the same project that one of my best friends is advertising on the next page that his are better. And you're still his idea. It's like, this is pretty basic shit, dude. Well, and plus, it's your magazine. You can do whatever you want. Yeah, yeah, right. You can do whatever you want when you own a magazine. It's like, well, no, you can't because it's a free magazine, you know? People didn't figure that out for years and years and years. People contacted me towards the end of it, and there was like this one guy out at Stevens, and he was like, I told him, I was like, well, you know Starfish is based on advertising. He was like, uh-oh. Like, he couldn't believe it, you know? Like, it's the free magazine, and people couldn't figure out that, yeah, it was, it was funded, 100% funded by advertising. I wasn't just some rich guy who was like dumping money into this magazine to just run its mouth. I was I was generally trying to help my advertisers sell their products. That was the name of the game for me. Yeah. They hired me. It was, I hired me, and let's say they paid me a hundred dollars just per se, and then I would want to make sure they sold a hundred dollars worth of product as a result of that. You know, I wanted them to trust me that I was trying to sell their products. But the subscribers, you know, if you subscribe to Starfish, you basically subscribed once, and I would never take you off the list, even if you didn't renew, because I was so excited to have a subscriber. Quincy showed up right away too. He was part of the original Starfish crew. He was the art director. Um, he uh, he did the cover. He did our logo, and he was awesome. You know, like the highlight of every issue was like getting the Quincy Quig cartoons, and that was another thing that people really liked too. People really liked Terry yeah. Parker's stuff too. He made these little cartoons and stuff, and Terry was always so awesome because he was just. And a lot of people took it so seriously and you couldn't make fun of them. Whereas Terry was someone who just realized that all press was good press and there was no such thing as bad press and just do what we want to do. You know, yeah. he knew that we were just making fun and fun was fun and it wasn't something he needed to be worried or upset about. That's right. It was just 
know, which was the, the majority of it, the people in there. Because like we said earlier, there was a lot of inside jokes and stuff like that. You know, but it was always between like me and my really good friends. You know, people would think, oh, it, it, this is shit's like uncensored. It's like, no, if I made fun of Jake, Jake oh. read it, you know. If I made fun of Clark, Clark read it, you know. And when, every time when something was kind of on edge, you know, then it was like, I check with the person first. You know, and then it was yeah. like, if we thought it's funny, then it stays in. It's funny. We were laughing. And, you know, yeah. other people who weren't part of our immediate circle of friends, then they <laughs> didn't think it was funny. It was yeah. like, well, I'm sorry, but maybe you guys shouldn't read it anyways. Yeah. Ultimately, ultimately, it's up to you. If you don't want to read the magazine, then don't pick it up. Don't pick it up. It's free. It's sitting there. I mean, I'm. Look at the pictures, you know, because the pictures are sick. Yeah. And another thing that made the hiatus was there was no more shops. All the shops had closed. So then our distribution was kind of like, well, where the hell are we going to do with these, man? Because there's no more like snowboard connection. There's no more revolution. I was getting too old and I wasn't as cool as I used to be. So I kind of felt like either someone needed to take over who was going to keep it going along kind of the big brother lines. You know, I was a lot more entertaining when I was younger before I had kids and I was like, going to Tennessee on snow skate trips and making moonshine and smoking toads and, you know, whatever else we were up to. Yeah, exactly. And, and then I tried to get along. John Metz to do it. who was doing this like totally awesome zine. Yeah. The Algerian, yeah. which is an Idaho based zine, which I mean, they, they were just like these hilarious little zines. Like one of them came with like a free condom. The condom was oh, like, really? the condom was like stapled on it, you know, so it had a hole in it. But yeah. And he was a snow skater and he was like, oh, I'm down to do it. You know, and we, he actually, he actually laid out a magazine and we were supposed to hook up with the concrete wave dudes and they were going to do like an Easter egg insert magazine in their magazine. And they may make it a lot of copies, like, I don't know, over 10,000 copies. And it, you know, so John, John makes this, makes this funny story and he makes this whole, this hilarious magazine. So I send this magazine off to this guy and I'm like, this is hilarious, man. See what he's going to say. And he calls me back and he's just pissed. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, what, why is this guy so pissed, man? And finally he's like, you don't know anything about this. You don't watch the news, do you? And I was like, no, I don't watch the news. dude. And he's like, it's a, this whole article about how not to be a fat bastard, like some guy at Subway. <laughs> and it was like he was doing this subway thing and then it turned out that that guy had just been arrested for like being a pedophile oh yeah we didn't see that coming <laughs> tim i want to thank you for years of starfish magazine inspirational photos and entertaining stories i want to thank you for the serpentine massacre which is an awesome opportunity to compete against fellow snow skaters in a fun, highly competitive atmosphere. I also want to thank you for coming on The Brain, man. Thanks for having me. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Hit that bell so you know when we put new videos out. Follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Brain Aqua. <laughs>